as uh, with all the spaces of uh, of make way and all the events that we are doing we want to keep this virtual space uh, safe and here i would like to share with you what we consider in make way as a as a safe physical or digital space so uh, we we think that people can express their views, their needs and opinions, but in a non-polarizingly, non-judgmental way and respectfully enter into dialogue with each other. So this is a space that we hope we can trust each other and there's not going to be any sorts of discrimination, harassment or any other emotional, psychological or uh, other type of harm. So note, uh, note of that. And uh, before we dive into the content, just a few words about the Makeway program that uh, made also this research project uh, possible. Uh, the Makeway program is a strategic partnership focusing on SRHR uh, with the aim to embrace intersectionality for health equity and justice and uh, make uh, SRHR available and realize SRHR for all leaving no one behind. The core partners of the Makeway program is Akina Mamawa Africa, the Circle of Concerned uh, Women, uh, African Women Theologians, the Forum for African Women Educationalists, Liliana Foundations, VSO, uh, Netherlands, and VEMOS. So uh, altogether we we started this program in 2021, and uh, this uh, project, this research project that we are presenting to you today is part of our evidence building and lobby and advocacy work. So um, I would like to invite uh, my colleague Esther Wambui uh, from Akina Mamawa Africa to share with uh, all of us uh, the findings of the study that we did. Esther Wambwikimani is the program officer for SRHR at the Kinamamawa Africa, but she's also the founder of um, the Mara Foundation, a feminist organization working to strengthen women's and girls' voices in marginalized communities to challenge and transform the status quo. Esther has extensive experience in feminist leadership development movement building for social change and advancing women's and girls' rights and advocacy. Uh, as a background, Esther is a trained psychologist and feminist, and uh, she was part of the core group uh, around this research program of the African Medical Equipment Facility in Kenya. So Esther, I would uh, like to ask you to come in and we start the presentation of our findings. Yeah, thank you very much, Miria. And good afternoon, everyone. Good morning for those that are joining us from our places where it's morning. Good, um, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> thank you for, for joining us today as we launch the findings of our research that we called the Af of course, that is the African Medical Equipment Facilities. And you know, the question we were really asking: does this new blended facility finance facility? really contribute to equitable access to healthcare services. Next slide, please. I think uh, the first thing for us to really kind of understand would be really to understand what is IFC, which is, you know, fin uh, International Financial Cooper Finance Corporation. So it is a member of the World Bank Group. Uh, it is the private arm of the World Bank. And what it does is that it offers investment and advisory services to encourage private sector development on matters health. It also uses a blended, uh, blended finance to be able to mobilize more resources other than their own existing uh, resources that they have. Next slide, please. So what is AMEF, uh, <clears throat> which is in full is the African Medical Equipment Facility? It is a financing facility that was launched during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we all know that during COVID, you know, health system really struggled and issues to do with medical equipment were, you know, dire in, in Africa. So it was launched during that time. Uh, what it does is that it focuses on working with uh, fi to finance health 
uh, small and medium enterprises and what what is it supposed to do to help them be able to buy medical equipment so that then they can continue providing healthcare services. And they also work with a local finance institution and specifically for Kenya under this study, you know, the institution that AMF is working with is Cooperative Bank. And then it also has a regional focus. So it was supposed to start in almost five African countries, but then it started in, in, in Kenya. The first rollout happened in Kenya and, you know, it will be rolled out in Cote d'Ivoire sometimes, I think in the year. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Next slide, please. So what was the aim of this study um, in terms of what did you want to really achieve? Uh, one of the things that we really wanted to achieve in it was to really be able to assess how the AMF and the blended finance uh, and the blended finance in general can really contribute to the inc increased healthcare access for poor for poor people, vulnerable people, and also universal health coverage. Uh, and also, we realized that in this study, uh, some of the financiers, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is Global Finance Facility, which uh, we know that uh, for those that are aware that it really supports vulnerable vulnerable groups, especially on issues to do with reproductive maternal health and newborn and child. And we really wanted to really assess how does it work and also its you know its connection with GFF. Uh, we also wanted to really understand, you know, will this AMF really reach poor population it represents? Uh, and, and because it's the first of its kind, this uh, blended facility, then it presented an opportunity for us to really look at, okay, this is the first time we are hearing about, this is the first time uh, such a blended facility is being rolled out in Kenya. So will it be able to you know, do as it's supposed to be to, to do in terms of really ensuring there is universal healthcare coverage and also provide the finances that it needs to provide to the small and medium health uh, enterprises. And also we, because then this is not new work, it was also work that is, you know, continuing and it was a build up for an earlier study that WEMOS, which is our partner started, which really kind of described the investments that IFC Health is doing in the recent years. And also there were other previous studies uh, that were really, re they were in relation to the private sector when it comes to the promotion of right to health in Kenya. So it wasn't, you know, it was already a build up to some of the existing work that was, that was there in before. Next slide, please. So yes, how does this AMF work? And of course, just to repeat, you know, with NGOs, we like saying things in short forms. So most of the time you hear IFC, AMF. So just so that then we all are together, African Medical Equipment Facility. So how does it work? And I'll really talk more about the finances, the financiers. So we have the Financial Institution and Services Wing, whose work is to be able to de to de risk the, the loans that small and medium enterprises will take through the uh the <clears throat> through the private health i mean through the private health providers who will then buy the equipment to be able to get to provide the services and the equipment they're buying it from who the manufacturers of those medical equipment so that's one of these aspects that how it works but then apart from the local you know manufacturers i mean the local finances that lend the money to the health providers to buy the equipment from the specific manufacturers. So there's also the advisory wing where it also it focuses on really training, procurement, maintenance of the equipment. And I remember when we were doing the, the interviews, um, we, we were told that, you know, the training aspect is to ensure that then uh, if you decide or if you buy this equipment you actually really understand you know the equipment in full they get people to train you to train about maintenance and how you know you can continue to also manage the business side which you know when you hear what business you think about profits thank you very much let's next slide and i think um my colleague will also speak more to this so who are the actors i mentioned so we have two 
international so it's being co-funded by two international channels so of course we have the international development association the private sector window and then we have now the global finance facilities for women children and adolescents which of course we've mentioned before in the first slide is you know also hosted at the world bank together with ifc and then we also have uh, the local financial institutions, which is the cooperative bank, which I've mentioned before. And then we have the health, healthcare and small and medium enterprises. And then we also have the original equipment manufacturers. And for this specific one, uh, the manufacturers that are partnering in this program, of course, uh, allow me to mention their names, of course, manufacturing like General Electric, uh, we have other manufacturers like Carl Stores, I hope I pronounced the word correctly, and also Philips, which, you know, just from the name uh, that you're mentioning, you see that they are really high end manufacturing of medical equipment. Next slide, please. So, you know, I'll rush through this slide because we've already spoken about it. You know, you know, we know that GFF is also part of AMF and it's actually contributing uh, around six million, um, six million dollars for this facility. And maybe just to mention that, you know, the resources for AMF, all of the resources are around 200 million dollars. Uh, Next slide, please. Okay, some of the research questions that we were asking, uh, you know, we spoke to healthcare providers, we spoke to uh, CSOs, and, and some of the questions we were asking were, you know, how is AMF designed? Um, sorry. And how has it been operationalized in Kenya? And, you know, how does AMF, AMF really contribute to the Kenyan health system re reforms that are really aimed at ensuring the realization of universal universal health coverage and then what are the unlikely impacts on people's access on people's access especially of course women girls and most vulnerable uh, vulnerable groups so those are some of the questions and maybe just to mention uh, before we move to the other slides that you know as, as we asked these questions, we also recognized that we had some limitations in the studies. And one of the limitations I must say is that we realized that this that study does not really address the actual impact of AMEF. And why is that? Because, you know, we did this study when AMEF was in the rollout stages, the early stages of the rollout, and then also the second uh, implication. Uh, the second limitations we had was the fact that we did not get a chance to really speak to the manufacturers, you know, the General Electric, Philips, and the local finance financial institution, which I've mentioned being Cooperative Bank, uh, because they did not respond to our interview invitation. So hopefully after this launch, they will. <laughs> and then, of course, the last thing is the fact that, you know, uh, the focus of this study is really in Kenya since this is where it was rolled out and also it was it hasn't been rolled out in 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 Cote d'Ivoire so we are not able to really provide you know documentation can you hear me somebody is talking hello you can go ahead oh thank you yeah, so you, we are not also able to provide like breakdowns, contract, and documentation beyond what was already available when you're doing the study. So I just want, thought it would be really wise, you know, as we are going through, uh, you know, the research findings and, and YMF that then you can also understand what our limitations are and where we are coming from. Next slide, please. So here, this is where we get the findings. And, you know, when we spoke to the different service providers, especially those from the private health providers, you know, and please note the focus of also AMF is really small, medium enterprises that are purely private. So we find that, yes, the private healthcare providers were very interested in AMF and they were really positive. But then again, 
we spoke to civil society that you know they were kind, they were really skeptical about MF, and I think why that was it, you know, it's also because of the fact that we we know that you know the responsibility of provision of healthcare and universal health coverage, you know, solely you know sits at the government uh, responsibility. So then you know having MF really focusing on private uh, healthcare. I mean, private uh, healthcare, then you, of course, civil society were a bit skeptical about it. Yes, it allows private facility to access more financing, uh, financing to purchase equipment, but also note that the choice is limited because then the equipment that they want, you know, uh, to purchase are the high end and expensive equipment because of the kind of manufacturers that, you know, are involved in, you know, you've, I mentioned before, manufacturers like General Electric, Philips, Carl Stores, all of them. I think Carl Stores is, is a German uh, manufacturer. I find that then because of the fact that it's, you know, the choices are for really high end equipment and also from high end manufacturers that are involved, then it becomes really difficult in terms of the choice the health providers, you know, in private facilities can purchase the, the kind of equipment they want. Also, yes, it aims to finance affor affordable health, I mean, uh, health small, medium enterprises, especially at the primary care. But what are considered as uh, health small, medium enterprise by IFC standards are really medium to large healthcare providers when compared to Kenya standards. And allow me to just paint a picture. So when you look at the standards of IFC, small, medium enterprise really has an annual um, annual uh, profits of 100,000 to 3 million do US dollars. So, you know, if you just guess in terms of just Kenyan months, for those that are Kenyan, allow me to, to use this example. It means that that facility must have at least 10 million profits, uh, 10 million Kenya shillings, or even 100 million Kenya shillings as profits. But in Kenyan context, that is not the healthcare provider that we have in our rural home. You know, with that, you know, category, you find that with the standards, you find that that really falls under, you know, major hospitals in Kenya. So you think about hospitals like Coptic, hospitals like Aga Khan, hospitals like, you know, hospitals like, you know, uh, Nairobi hospital so then you you ask yourself so who really is the target who is the definition of this uh, health small and medium enterprise uh yes the other finding was that yes uh, there was that willingness of ames to work with more affordable manufacturers but then so far it's only large manufacturers that have already expressed interest and of course, not lower uh, cost manufacturers. And when we spoke to some of the health providers, they're saying, you know, equipment from China, Japan, India are much cheaper. But in the list of AMF, there's no manufacturers that is coming from those countries, making it really challenging for the uh, health providers that are operating small and medium enterprise healthcare uh to be able to even make a decision to even buy because if they can get the same equipment you know at another manufacturer that is cheaper then definitely they will not be able to use this facility and then the other finding was that one of the gff which is the global finance facility key area of interest is to really support most disadvantaged population and be able to really close the inequality gap but when you look closely at really what AMF contribution is, it really does not contribute to this mission directly. AMF focus on, of course, on small, medium enterprises, you know, in paper, but in, re in realistically, the standards, when you look at it, is, of course, of large uh, facilities when it comes to care. That the loans that they are asking, I mean, they're, they're asking or requesting the, the healthcare providers to take they are unlikely to really benefit those small, low-end, affordable healthcare providers. And, you know, think about the clinic that is, you know, when you go to your rural home, you know, the clinic that is there, that is between where you live to the, the maybe level one or level two district hospital. That's the nearest clinic um, that you're going to. So you find that, you know, when you look at AMF, it really will not really benefit those specific healthcare providers, but more so 
the high end that I've spoken about. And then of course, um, you know, the low income populations, most of most of the low income and vulnerable populations really go to private sector. So they go to that district hospital rather than of course, go to the private uh, healthcare because of how the cost. And maybe one point to point out before you move to the other, to the other um, uh, slide is the fact that, you know, if for example, uh, you as a health facility, you manage to uh, acquire this equipment from a private, uh, private provider. What that means is that you would want to be able to recoup some of the money that you will have used or the loan to be able to pay the loan with interest and also get profits. And you, we all know that in to be able to recoup this, it means that you will have to transfer that cost to the people, I mean, the, the plants and who are patients. So you find that then the cost of, of, of getting, you know, services becomes so high because you have to recoup the money that you have for this equipment, which for first, it's very expensive. It has, you know, expensive manufacturer, even the loan, you're not able to really access that loan. So I just wanted to also emphasize that. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, so I put this uh, slide here so that then we can also get really a bigger picture of you know, global finance facilities, um, their mandate. And their mandate, as we've mentioned before, as I've mentioned before, is really around reproductive maternal, newborn and child health care. And of course, to be able to invest in larger universal health coverage. But also, as I've mentioned before, who are those uh, most vulnerable groups, you know, women, girls, those living with disabilities? Where do they visit the, you know, the healthcare for healthcare services? They go to public facilities. So they're unlikely to go to private facilities for help. When it comes to, you know, maternal services, uh, sexual reproductive health and services, majority of them still relies in public health care. And also that, you know, healthcare providers likely to be financed, are, you know, the ones that are going to be financed with AMEF are not really going to be those low uh, providers that, you know, these vulnerable groups uh, and people are actually looking for. They are going to be, of course, in the high end uh, providers, which means that, you know, when you look at it critically, you know, what GFF role and mandate, core mandate, and what the, you know, the core mandate of AMF do not align completely, like they are separate. So then you ask yourself which questions that we ask ourselves, and, you know, you'll see in the recommendation is that, you know, does it make sense for the contribution that GFF is already making within AMF? And, you know, what do we recommend moving forward? So I just wanted to put that so that then we can, you know, key, you know, uh, understand it better, but also just see the, the bigger picture of it. Please, next slide, please. Um, in the next slide, you know, we talk about, you know, the risks uh, that AMF has when it comes to health system strength, strengthening. And one of it is the, the fact that there'll be an even inequitable distribution of medical uh, equipments. Why? Because then, you know, of the, you know, private sector investing in the in, in the equipment, it means that that costs will have to be recovered. And how will that be able to be done? It means that then, you know, people like you and I will have to dig deep pocket in our pockets to be able to recover these costs. Uh, also, there was also a risk because there was no, there's, there's lack of involvement of uh, local manufacturers, especially those coming from Africa. And also, I already mentioned this, that also for other low-end manufacturers coming from Japan, China, have not really expressed interest. So AMF still has, you know, those high-end manufacturers who are, have already in, are already part of AMF, but also have expressed interest. Also, the other risk is that, you know, we all know that the health, providers that we have really are still working in private sector and also um, public sector. So you find that the risk would be, there'll be maybe double practice of health 
professional and misuse of healthcare equipment in public hospitals. Why? Because then they would want to refer patients to go to the private hospital so that then they can recoup their profits. Uh, and then, of course, there will, you know, the risk of around you know, the lack of involvement of CSOs regarding the how the AMF was launched or even the rollout and the information around that. And also the fact that it doesn't, it's, it has limited range of equipment. And allow me to say this, that, you know, one of the healthcare providers said, oh, you know, maybe my need is just a small, you know, equipment that supports me to be able to see how far along uh, a, a woman who is pregnant uh, is. And at that time, AMF is not providing such low end equipment. So, you know, how can I be able to really take a, take a loan when I realize that it does not really uh, look at the equipments that I really, really need, but then the ones that they are actually trying to push us to buy. So the next slide, please. Okay, so in conclusion, so what were our conclusions when it comes to this research? And, you know, the conclusions we draw were that the strength of AMF is that it allows private facilities to be able to access more financing to purchase mod medical equipment, which, of course, potentially raises the quality of services they provide. But then, you know, the private providers and manuf manufacturers are the only ones that are interested in this project for profits, allow me to use it to say that. Uh, that, you know, when it comes to its contribution to access to poor population, AMF is unlikely to do that because then it is in how it is designed, that uh, it is not designed to do to, to do specifically that, ensure that then it contributes to access to health for pure population because the loans will not really benefit those small and low uh, and healthcare providers. And according to the results and the interviews we had is that uh, low income populations mainly really, which is you know the truth, they actually access health through the public sectors. Uh, the other conclusions we had was that um, as essential uh, maternal health care services are also delivered through, you know, uh, are de are de delivered through the public system, especially those that are left behind, which are the vulnerable groups. So then the investments in AMF could in fact take GFF off track. So this is where the marrying of, uh, you know, GFF and, 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 and AMF is really does not marry in terms of the, the goals. And then also the other conclusion we drew is this, there was really the lack of support of local manufacturers that this AMF did not put in account into that. So which really was raised by all the interviews that, that we had. And of course, they were pushing to have local manufacturers in Africa, but also that are those that are low. And then also all CSOs that we interviewed, uh, as well as some of healthcare prof professionals, were really concerned that in Kenya, where, you know, we all, in Kenya, where equitable services, uh, access to services is not ensured, AMF and other finance financing facility focus on private healthcare could really hamper the progress uh, when it comes to really health equity because the investment now has gone to part to private healthcare instead of really public healthcare. Next slide, next slides, please. So as we drew that co those conclusions, we 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 came up with recommendations because then you can't draw conclusions, critique something without really making strong recommendations. So. And we have rec recommendations to GFF, to the government, to IFC, and to um, IDA, and to for sorry for GFF. Our recommendation is that you know GFF to not allocate further resources to AMF, and to avoid rolling out to more countries at least you know until you know it has been proven otherwise. So. Even though when you look at the larger 200 million that AMF, the basket of AMF, which is 200 million, and you look at GFF contributions, you can term it as modest, 6 million. But then again, you know, in terms of, you know, the mandates, they do not, they do not marry. So then we feel like really those modest resources will go a long way in ensuring that they realize their mandate of uh, access to reproductive maternal child health care for all and universal coverage. 
that um, the other recommendation we have is that the GFF Trust Committee should be able to be more transparent in its funding uh, related to decision making process. And then, you know, which, you know, I've already also mentioned that GFF can also use this AMF as a learning opportunity to really better understand the impact the blended finance uh, system has in Kenya, but also, you know, cross country learning opportunity that will inform their future decisions in regards to blended facilities and their cooperation to IFC. Next slide, please. So recommendations to IDA is that, <laughs> sorry, as health, call, as health goals should not be a trade-off against economic trade goals, we recommend that the IDA team, its board and its members, to, uh, members countries to assess the investments in the health sector with a health equity lens. Uh, in particular, the, the effects that financing of higher end private healthcare can have when it comes to access to equitable healthcare which they should actually be able to really give a strong critical uh, considerations for that. And then also the other recommendation we have is that for them to be able to ex ex expand the access to medical equipment, they should consider directly supporting local manufacturers or work together with, of course, African Union and existing initiatives like African Medical uh, Supplies Platform that will ensure to address the needs of the the healthcare providers who are truly small and, and small and, and, and medium enterprises. The recommendation to IFC, which is the International Finance Facility, is that they need to access to expand access to medical equipment, consider directly supporting local manufacturers. We cannot in, uh, continue insisting on that. Please support you know, local manufacturers or work together with, of course, the African Union and its existing initiative, which you've mentioned before, like African Medical Supplies Platforms. So here is our recommendation, our beloved Kenyan government. So what should the Kenyan government really do? You know, it should ensure that the part, the part of the proposed reforms made uh, for, for NHIF really to include safeguarding resources that are meant to improve access to healthcare in the public sector. That the failures of NHIF indiscriminately reimbursing private sector have costs uh, for public health development, equitable access to, for vulnerable population ought to be addressed. And this is in how you know NHIF continues to reimburse you know, uh, healthcare providers. So it should make sure that then there are the reforms there that will continue to safeguard the resources that are geared towards improving healthcare. That uh, in order for Kenya to really achieve universal health coverage, broader tax-based financing will improve access, uh, quali quali access, quality, and ensure equitable access to healthcare for all indiscriminate indiscriminately. The, invis the, in the investment to achieve UHC should actually focus on public sector, which we, you know, most you know, CSO also echoes this, that, you know, investment should actually go to public sector rather than going to private sector. And lastly, that we should also have, as we also accept this, you know, proposal, as we accept this, you know, facility and these amazing plans, you know, the Kenyan government should actually come up with a clear sustainability plan. You know, when this blended facilities, you know, we know that, you know, they are there to play a transitory role you know, but then what is the government putting in place to ensure that then there is that sustainability? So we need to be able to do that because past, we've really known that, you know, we've had so many programs like this that we realize that, you know, there's no assessment. So we don't know in terms of monitoring, have they been able to, you know, reach out to the groups that they're supposed to reach out? Have they actually be able to, you know, address the gaps that exist? Have they been able to, you know, benefit the Kenyan government? I mean, Kenyans and the Hasla nations as we all are. So those are the recommendations to ensure that there is a clear sustainability plan. Thank you very much. And you can find the full reports online. Thank you. Thank you, Esther, for the presentation of our findings. As you also said in the beginning, 
uh, our findings were based on the interviews that we did with healthcare providers, uh, with beneficiaries, and all the stakeholders that actually accepted to speak to us when we're trying to figure out more uh, about the AMF facility. So we have a wonderful panel today with us uh, to move the discussion forward as that was the, the aim of this webinar, uh, to share with you what we found and an exchange. So I would like to present our, um, our panelists for today, and uh, then I will address some questions to them. So we have Dr. Sneha Kaneganti. She leads the GFF's private sector engagement, which includes innovative financing, private sector partnerships, and technical assistance to country governments on engaging private sector in health systems. Uh, Dr. Kaneganti started her career as a physician in India and has over 15 years of experience working in health systems and development finance across Asia and Africa. And in addition to her medical degree, she has a master's in public health and a master of business administration from Johns Hopkins University. Welcome, uh, Dr. Kaneganti. Uh, we also have with us Wangari Kinoti, a Kenyan feminist who has worked in various roles in national and African uh, women's rights organizations in the international women's rights and social justice arena for the last two decades. She has led work on political participation, gender-based violence, land rights, extractives, and corporate accountability, also unpaid care and domestic work and access to decent work, public services, and social protection. Wangari is the global lead for women's rights and feminist alternatives at ActionAid International, and also an associate of the Naui AfriFem Macroeconomics Collective. And last but not least, we have uh, our own Dr. Stella Bozire, uh, who helped us with uh, the conduction of this study. Stella is a global health advocate working in the intersection of policy, equity, healthcare financing, and gender, with many years of experience in the African region. She has worked with civil society organizations, grassroots movements, and activists with capacity building and supporting movements in, uh, to address inequalities in healthcare service delivery and, and policy, and also has extensive experience in health system strengthening, healthcare financing, SRHR, uh, public health, and gender being a cross-cutting theme in her expertise. So welcome to, to our panelists. So um, let me start with, uh, with Wangari, if uh, I can address the first question to you. Uh, because we know that with uh, now we AFRIFEM, you conducted a paper on the medical equipment leasing in Kenya, um, which is very close to, to what we did also with the AMEF. So based on that, I wanted to ask you, Wangari, if you see any of the lessons learned from um, from the facility that you studied coming in into the rollout of the AMEF uh, in Kenya, in its rollout and its uh, design. So if you can reflect a bit on that. You're muted, sorry. Never fails to happen. Thanks so much, uh, Miria. Thank you, Esther, for, for the presentation. I will. I just wanted to say hello on video, and I'll put off my video because I'm. I don't have electricity, so I'm trying to conserve my battery on the laptop. But I just wanted to show that I'm a real person behind the voice. Um, and thanks, thanks for for that question and um, the opportunity to you know to contribute to this to this conversation so just to, to give sort of a little bit of background um about the paper that you mentioned on medical equipment leasing in kenya um so my co-author uh, crystal simeone and i were approached by dawn which is development alternatives for women in a new era to provide a case study for their series that was providing a feminist analysis on public-private partnerships or PPPs in the global south. So this was a wider series and we contributed um, a case study and that focused um, on, on the managed equipment um, service program, um, which was launched in Kenya in 20, 2015. Um, and I'm sure um, some of the uh, people on, on the webinar may be uh, familiar with this, with this program, which is basically contracts valued at about 430 million US dollars 
um, signed between the Ministry of Health in Kenya and the country governments and and then private sector providers. And there were five main um, <clears throat> there were five main um, um, private sector partners um, um, in in the program. <clears throat> and so it was to supply and install specialized medical equipment in a total of ninety eight hospitals across the county. Now, and like AMF, this was focused on public um, hospitals or public health, uh, you know, public health sector rather than private. So it's been interesting to kind of look at the similarities and the parallels with what Esther has been describing. And it was really designed to designed to cover the, the you know, sort of dialysis, emergency, maternal child health, basic and advanced surgery, critical care, imaging services. So again, um, quite sort of broad um, areas uh, when it comes to medical equipment, but it was also aimed to upgrade hospitals, including um, through the training of staff and suppliers, um, you know, uh, and then also to provide regular service maintenance, repairs and replacement of, of the equipment at no additional cost. And remember this was equipment that was being leased rather than purchased. So that's also um, an interesting contrast with, with with AMF. <clears throat> so, but why did we want to, to look at this? Yes, it was about the actual outcomes, um, positive or negative of this, um, of this program, but we really wanted to look at it against the backdrop of, of the current global financial arch um, architecture, um, which is really where our main area of interest and research um, lies um, as a collective. Um, and that's really why we, we opted to title our chapter medical equipment leasing in Kenya, neocolonial global finance and misplaced health priorities. And I'll give a couple of highlights, which I think uh, relate um, to what Esther has, has presented from, from the report. Um, so so in, in this sense, I'm saying these are the common lessons um, are around these kind of programs. One thing we found, um, and this is something that you know was was reported widely, including to the committee at the Senate that looked into this issue once complaints were raised by the counties. One of the major one was was uh, was lack of transparency in contracts, costing, and and allocation. So um, there was a feeling that there was lack of full disclosure by by the Ministry of Health on the contracts for the program. Um, and this was, you know, really what came out as, as, as one of the major two concerns. So for here I'm talking about, for example, um, the Senate report talking about uh, the fact that some facility heads were not fully aware of the exact equipment they were expected to benefit from. Um, and, and, and as such, there was the fear or perception that, um, you know, that some of the equipment, that, that there was incomplete supply of equipment to facilities because facility heads did not, were not fully aware of what exactly they were supposed to get. And in, indeed, in writing this paper, we found it quite difficult to obtain some official information on the program as, as a whole. But, you know, it's, it's to say that because this program was so, such a big program, right, so basically, the third biggest allocation um, for, for the 2016-2017 fiscal year. Um, after, you know, after allocations to the biggest and second biggest referral hospitals. Um, and and why, why that's important is because budgets are the easiest way to tell what a government is prioritizing. Um, and, 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 you know, as this is what will actually put resources into, into you know, whatever this prioritization is. So healthcare. Um, is across the board the biggest budget item for county governments, at least at the time that we were conducting this study, accounting for, for about 25% of total budgets and approximately 5% of those total budgets per county were going to, to MES. And this, this is information we got. MES, sorry, is the medical mm -hmm. um, equipment services um, um, a program. Anyway, so so that that those sort of figures we have from the Institute of Economic mm -hmm. Affairs. Sorry, okay. I, I, I'm not sure if. No, I, you you answer the question definitely, and we see a lot of commonalities. Oh, well, I haven't I haven't quite uh, concluded, but I can give space to another panelist, and I can come back with some of the things I wanted to say more broadly about the. Um, well, about health, about prioritization, but also about how this then fits into the wider global financial mm -hmm. architecture. Would okay. you like me to do that now or do it uh, we will. I will return back to you uh, on that because this is something that I would like uh, you to, to, to share your reflection on indeed. 
Um, I would like to, to turn now to Dr. Kaneganti, uh, who is from the Global Financing Facility, uh, to ask you uh, to share some, some thoughts. What was behind the strategic thinking, behind the decision for the GFF to co-fund uh, this AMEF project? Because that was quite new for the GFF. And given that, that the rollout in Cote d'Ivoire is starting, uh, if you already learned something from the Kenya case to bring to, to the Cote d'Ivoire case. So over to you, Sneha. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you for inviting us to participate in this important discussion. Um, maybe just to start with framing for GFF what led us to support AMEF. Um, the, for GFF, the focus is on how can we support the improving RMNCH and outcomes, right? health, nutrition across that whole spectrum for women, children, and adolescents. And that means that we usually focus in on the services themselves, but then also we support the health systems aspect that is required to deliver those services. And in this case, in Kenya in particular, we see that public sector resources for health are growing, but there is still a very significant proportion of women and children, including poor women and children, who are going to the private sector for care. And you see this in the data. And if, the, and I think the Kenyan government also sees this, which is what's reflected in our the national health strategies in Kenya, the investment framework uh, that the country platform developed, because they very much look at how do we strengthen the public sector, but how do we also better leverage the private sector that is present and is delivering services in, in the area we work on? Um, and when I say private sector for GFF, we mean both for-profit and not-for-profit. So that's also important to note. So NGOs are included in that for us. Um, and so we kind of follow the government's aim of saying, you know, there needs to be better use of all of the available resources in the health system, both public and private. And what that means is different across public and across private, which is why the GFF has a very large program in Kenya where we support the government on strengthening a number of things that are driven through the public sector channel. Um, the investment framework is available publicly so people can look at that information the, the co-financing grant that GFF provides alongside IDA and the areas it supports, largely around the rollout of UHC, the financing reforms linked to that to make sure that there's actually financial coverage for the most vulnerable, um, as well as strengthening the government's own systems for budgeting, for planning, for accountability, data systems, CRVS, all of these critical things that help us understand how the system is functioning as a whole. But there is also then the element of what about the private sector? If the government and if as a country, there is a need to draw on private sector to complement the public sector, then we have to look at what are the constraints that private sector providers themselves are facing. And a major one that keeps coming up is access to finance, not just in Kenya, but in a number of countries. And so when the AMF opportunity came up, the the, there was a way for GFF to use a small amount of funding as what we call um, a first loss guarantee, which means that by providing this guarantee, we can help reduce the cost of the overall the end loan to these small and medium healthcare providers. Because I'm sure um, we don't actually have someone from Kenya Healthcare Federation online on the, in the panel, but perhaps in the audience. This is a continuing challenge in most countries that local banks don't necessarily understand the health sector. And if you want to take a loan, they're going to charge you like 200, 250% collateral um, and very high interest rates. And so that means that it reduces the services that may then be available to the population or increases prices. And so having more affordable lending options is important for us as a health system strengthening tool. And that's where the AMF facility comes in, where IFC partners with the local bank, sets up the facility using IFC funding and the local bank funding. And then the GFF first loss, which is only for Kenya. In the other countries, it's the private sector window from IDA that does the guarantee. Um, the GFF first loss comes in to say that 
because we are providing a de-risking to you, the bank, now you need to provide better terms and cheaper loans to the people that need to borrow from you for help. Um, at the same time, the, the GFF funding is only drawn down if there is a loss that is incurred. And we've seen historically that health providers, when they do get loans, are actually very good about repaying them. So we, we actually see this as a sort of a temporary um, instrument that is used to help make banks and the health providers come closer together and set this up in a more systematic manner. Um, and then, you know, if the guarantee is not used, then it can be redeployed elsewhere. And this 6 million from GFF is meant to leverage up to 100 million of private financing. And that's a very significant ratio in how it's set up. So I think that's how we kind of looked at the, the decision for AMF to say, is this a complementary tool using blended finance, helping private money go where it would otherwise not be able to go? Because it would otherwise not go to the health sector. It would otherwise not go to small and medium healthcare providers. And that's a, a complementary tool for us alongside um, everything else that we continue to do on the, the public sector channels. Um, and of course, this is our first blended finance investment, especially through IFC. And we, AMF is a, is a 10 year lending facility. Um, I believe we're about in year two now, towards the end of year two, since the, the partnerships with the Kenyan banks was actually set up. So that's also important to reflect that there's still eight years ahead of us of seeing how this facility performs. And it, it would be a little bit premature to determine already now on the success or not, um, because we all know these things, these shifts take time. But at the same time, I think there are certain um, sort of early things that we're, we're taking as, as feedback as other countries might look to do this. Um, one question is, can facilities that are lending be more flexible because providers can have additional needs beyond just equipment alone, right? So um, what can we provide that could be additional value on that front? Um, and there's also, I think for us, the, the most critical aspect is the financing for services should be the, when I say the financing, I mean the coverage and user fees and affordability for the end patients that we're thinking about. That is very much within the public mandate of saying whether it's the NHIF rollout or some of the other programs that the Kenyan government has in place. Those are critical to make sure that people can actually access the services they need at that end point. Uh, a facility like Ameth, it has a very narrow mandate in that sense. It is simply to enable the providers to equip themselves better to deliver services. It cannot address some of the more systemic challenges that have also come up, I think, in the report, and which are extremely important, and which we all, I think, collectively continue to address, um, not through advocacy, but also through partnership, through technical assistance, through financing to the government. And I think that separation of how are services funded versus how are they provided Will, is going to continue because in many of our countries, we see this system of sometimes it's public, sometimes it's private. People go to whatever is closest to them. They go to whatever is open when they are done with their workday. And having restrictions on access to services would be, I think, counter to the mandate. So just to say that from an equity perspective, I think it, it would be critical to continue to help the, the Kenyan government on um, on the programs that are actually ensuring financial protection and coverage for payments for these services. Um, so that's just a, a little bit uh, about what led us to um, this sort of stage. And I'm not sure, uh, since I have to drop off literally in like a minute, Miria, um, I saw there was a hand up if anyone wanted to come in or any follow up, I'm happy to answer. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sneha. Um, also, our other panelist, Wangari, needs to leave at the hour. So I don't know, Wangari, if you have a few seconds to reflect on the equity aspect that you started saying before you, you leave us. And Sneha, thank you. And if there is anything, we can also communicate via email and, and share with the participants. 
Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Sneha, for um, your, your very, I think, important contributions. What I was going to say, or half of or a quarter of what I was going to say, because I do also need to leave, is that I was talking about uh, the second major area that we, we talked about, we, 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 um, that surfaced in the paper was around uh, gaps in priority setting. And this basically means, um, you know, to what extent um, there was a process of finding out what what makes most what makes what makes most sense for each county based on you know it's 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 uh, you know the, the sort of range of, of of its reality. So, for example, many of these counties where the, where sorry where like equipment was going, um, many of them are were in are in ge geographically remote and typically marginalized areas, and it, so it, it would come as no surprise that there would be constraints say there around water, electricity, specialists to manage the equipment, um, and so on. And 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 on, on on that basis, a year after the MES program was launched. Um, you know, there still were, you know, there's a lot of equipment sort of lying in hospitals not being not being used. But also at that time is when Kenya had the lo longest doctors um, nationwide strike in the country's history, lasting about 100 days. Um, and, and, and this this ended up sort of culminating in the jailing of, of the doctors union leadership at the time. Uh, but the strike was really around fairer remuneration and better working conditions. My point is that everything needs to be seen, um, 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 you know, things have to be seen in totality. So we found that, you know, sort of employing a one size fits all approach um, to the problem, um, you know, was, would not work because the problem presents itself in unique and diverse ways in different counties. So sort of that lack of due diligence and consultation between the national government and the county governments, and, in, and indeed all other stakeholders, including you know sort of private sector, including civil society and all that, that step was missed, and that made it extremely expensive. Including the fact that um, you know we we probably ended up spending um, up to 2017 and into early 2018 three times more what we should have been spending, including by opting to 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 purchase the equipment rather than, than leasing it. Um, but what I'm saying is that this is part of a wider problem where you kind of have um, an approach um, to, um, to healthcare um, or, or the health sector in, in, in many of, African, uh, of Africa's countries that is predominantly vertical and skewed towards supporting single issues or perceived needs um, such as specialized infrastructure. Right, so that's that's taking up a large percentage of working budgets, of resources, of you know all that, um, rather than having a broader approach that reflects the interlinkages and interdependencies of various functions. Right, so we have seen public and primary health strategies fall off the priority list of governments and into the hands of, of bilateral agencies. Um, there's a doctor called Dr. Richard Ayah, who Dr. Basire may know, um, who talks about our best public health infrastructure being, being foreign owned. Um, there's a lot more that, that I could say about that. Um, remember um, that uh, you know, women really are most dependent on, on health, um, facilities because of our own needs, including around reproductive health, but also because of our role as carers. So caring for those in our households, including taking them to medical facilities. And when there is an absence of, of you know, strong public health facilities, um, then, you, you know, we kind of women's work, women's labor, paid or unpaid, because women are also um, employed in in public sector, including in the in the health sector, that you know our labor then tends to to sort of subsidize for governments failing to to provide this, and and the failure is is as I said, um, based on a wider system, which I was, which we are calling the global finance the finance architecture. I'll stop there because I know there is no time, but please do read um, the paper I talked about alongside this paper that we're launching today. And do reach out if there's um, anything else I, I can kind of contribute to the to the conversation. I'd be very happy to do so. Thank you, Wangari, for sharing all that and uh, for staying um, for uh, for quite longer. And uh, for everyone, the paper that Wangari refers to was shared in the chat alongside uh, the paper by uh, the Make Way program, what we present today. So. These are two resources that 
uh, you can, um, yeah, you can review and then reach out to us and to Wangari if you have uh, questions or, or feedback. Great. Um, I would like now to turn um, to Dr. Stella. Uh, who was uh, leading this process, this research that uh, that we did uh, between Vemos and, uh, and Akina Mamawa Africa. And um, I would like to ask you, Stella, to share a few words on, on the process of, of, of this research and especially which were the main challenges. For example, how, how easy or difficult was to retrieve information about um, this financing facility and what did you encounter? So over to you. Thank you, Mira. Um, can you hear me well? Very well. Fantastic. Um, so my name is Dr. Stella Busiri. I'm a Kenyan physician, uh, but also a human rights doctor. Um, this was a very interesting con um, uh, study for me to be involved in because that, the, it brought in the issue around the intersection on of health systems, you know, and justice and equity around how it is investments in healthcare made. To start by just speaking about the whole process, how it went, I think for me, I never ever thought that um, information that is supposed to be publicly available would actually be very red tipped. I remember that we had to write a lot of emails and particularly to the concerned parties um, around IFC and we, our emails kept get, get, getting bounced, um, uh, they kept bouncing. Um, for the, those of um, some of the interview, uh, for some of the key informant interviews that we were expecting to speak to um, and who we knew really did not create time. And uh, those, the, the few that created time really did not even have de details. And I, and, and my feeling was there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of, I, I need somebody else to answer that question. I need somebody else to answer that question. And then we also reached out to the OEMs, you know, the manufacturers, and we wanted to speak to the ones which had been listed then because the, the, the list has expanded by IFCA as some of the, uh, the, the OEMs that are getting into this partnership. And one of them was Philips, you know, pharmaceuticals, you know, because of the issue of equipments, um, there's highly specialized equipment that they were, uh, the, 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 um, the partnership was going to make accessible to SMEs. Um, unfortunately, that was also not successful. And, and, and as much as I even know the physicians were involved, it just kind of broke my heart because if you're having an intervention that is supposed to literally improve the health outcomes of, um, of Kenyan citizens, then I think that one thing that you want to do is take up the opportunity to be able to speak about such. So we got a red tip. The place where we got a lot of information is from the doctors, many of the doctors who, are, who had heard about uh, about the research about the AMF study uh, rather the AMF implementation, um, representatives from KHF who are sitting in the KHF board. We also had top leadership around the uh, the president of Kenya Medical Association. We spoke to the some of the union members who are also physicians. You know, we spoke to independent physicians who are who are in private sector, and 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 it was very very warm conversations because they they I mean and I was to this as part of the challenges around the disconnect around this product that was floated into the market and the consumers of that product who are mostly um, SMEs and again also expanding on what SMEs mean it's not in our own definition. I think that was one of the greatest um, um, issues that we saw in terms of the, the, the challenges around the process to be able to just get key informant interviews. And this was more of a, a qualitative research, you know. Yes, we did a little bit of desk, a lot, not a little bit, a lot of desktop research to be able to collaborate and get more details. And so even as we got the information, our report really um, depended a lot on the desktop research to be able to beef up our report. And so it would have been a very um, interesting opportunity for either IFC um, um, and, 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 and some representatives who are coming from the OEMs to actually take place. We spoke to also in, um, a citizen independent from civil society organizations and we had their, their input around, um, around the process of, of implementing this because I, I mean, coming from the lessons that we had learned and, and that has been alluded to from the meds implementation of meds, really the question around, even if it's a private, um, a PPP, you know, uh, that is being implemented, the issue of public participation is not negated just because it's not government you know that you cannot hold people accountable but here is a product which is being introduced into the market that is supposed to benefit the kenyans and so there had to be a need of even having and listening to the voice of kenyans mayor so i think those um in terms of process there's still 
until now there's a lot of red tape you know and and and, and, and it's unfortunate you know it's it's, it's important to actually um, put the information out there let people access that information you know if there's a rebuttal give an opportunity for a rebuttal for clarity of information thank you thank you stella for um uh, shedding some more lights into into our process and all the uh, the difficulties actually and the limitations of uh, of the study i have one more uh, question for you uh, because you were involved in uh, the key informants um, interviews very much and you analyzed the findings so can you share maybe uh, one or two critical areas that kept on coming up in your discussions with uh, with the informants I had alluded initially, but let me now expand on it about the disconnect in this product being in the market and the consumers of this product, you know, and, and that is the, the, we're targeting uh, small and medium enterprises, which are facilities, you know, healthcare facilities to be able to access um, these loans and uh, to, to get the loans to be able to procure um, the equipment, you know, and most of them first did not know about it, right, we had to tell them about it, number one, and those who knew about it had very little information about it and would say oh we've heard about this uh i i don't we're waiting to get more information but i don't think this is for us why because when you look at the startup in terms of um SMEs, the startups um around 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 entrepreneurship around healthcare um one of the respondents actually said i i don't need i don't need um 300 million i just need five thousand dollars you know, I need $10,000. The equipment that I'm buying cannot be more than uh, $10,000 because I don't even have the space to be able to. But when you look at the equipment that are being sold by the OEMs, right, a very high end, you know, high tech. And so they are not literally going to target the um, what, what, what I'd call, because I mean, they're also speaking about uh, equity, um, the, the middle class um, Kenyans and, and the low income earning Kenyans. It wasn't supposed to target them. Those are, those are equipments, and I'm a physician, I can say this with confidence those are equipments that are in the Aga Khans they are equipments that are in the Nairobi hospitals you know with the Taiwan hospitals and not for SMEs and even when you're looking at the cost you know of this equipment you know and then one, one person say I'm um, asked very honestly that even if I'm getting a loan I mean somebody has to pay for the loan if it's coming I'm coming investing in my business and so that markup has to be borne by the patient you know who's accessing if it's an uh, radiological service like for instance the oncology uh, equipment which was on is on record that was bought for about 353 million I mean 353 million is not an SME right and so just thinking about such a facility the people who are actually accessing those facility are high end in a country where less than 20% of us have any form of social insurance in terms of medical and 17% of them are in the public social insurance you know just few in private so also the the, the key informant interviews were saying that i cannot actually target the common mananchi the common mananchi cannot be able to afford this the other running running theme around this conversation was also the issue around um around uh, the economic conditions, you know. I mean, there were better ways in which that um, they the would be able to have thought through um, supporting these physicians, supporting these facilities to be able to access this this um, this um, uh, product. In fact, one of them, a, a number of two or three of them said, I cannot go to cooperative bank to get a loan. It's one of the banks that has been listed. I will actually go to my SACO. I will have favorable interest. I will have favorable environment. My business will not be a threat because the people who are guaranteeing me are my own colleagues, you know, and so I have safety around finances, you know, around that. And so that was very important that it came out a, a, a lot like that. The other thing is actually the issue around the top bottom approach implementation of this of this um, project. And in the sense that it was just it was this is something which is good for you. Take it up, you know without really getting into doing a, a baseline assessment, because we asked for the baseline assessment. We asked for what it is that really influenced that decision, introducing the product into the market. And we didn't have any concrete evidence to actually tell us the, 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 the fundamental reasons why they were being introduced. And so there was a, not a needs assessment issues. That, and you have a lot of key players, stakeholders, that would have actually given a lot of inputs towards how the product would have been shipped, the, the end of product would actually have been delivered within the Kenyan market. Thank you. Thank you, very clear. And that explains uh, a lot about our, our main findings. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you, Stella. Um, 
we have 15 minutes uh, until the end of the webinar. So I would like to ask uh, the audience if they have any questions that the research team can, uh, can address. Unfortunately, our, part, our panelists, uh, Wangari and Dr. Sneha, had to, to step out. Uh, but uh, Dr. Stella is here and the rest of the research team from Vemos and Akina Mamawa Africa uh, are here. So we will be able to, to answer questions or maybe people have uh, thoughts to share or their experience uh, with similar facilities. So uh, I think you should be able to raise hand and then we will uh, unmute you. Uh, Marco, you want to come in? Yeah, thank you, Miria. Um, so I guess um, it, it's a question that uh, would have been better when uh, 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 Dr. Kaneganti was there because she's a representative of the GFF. But um, my doubt about this uh, facility is that um, when uh, we look at the needs uh, that are present uh, within the, uh, the Kenyan healthcare systems in terms of, in terms of uh, reproductive, maternal, and newborn care, um, we see that the, the needs um, according to the Ministry of Health itself are very, very basic in terms of equipment. We are talking about ambu bags. We are talking about suction machines. Uh, we are talking about, um, um, I know now I'm uh, missing the terms in English, but uh, very basic uh, equipment. Whereas when we look at the equipment offered by the AMEF, is uh, we are talking about CT scans, MRI, uh, a, uh, PAT uh, machines, very, very uh, um, technologically intensive equipment. Now I understand that, uh, I mean, in order to do blended finance, uh, it is necessary to, uh, you cannot do um, blended finance with equipment that costs a few hundred uh, dollars. You need to, blended finance is made to serve loans for thousands, uh, if not hundred thousands of, of dollars. Um, so this is a bit of the of the mismatch that we saw between the GFF uh, and the support to the AMF compared to the local needs in terms of in terms of reproductive, uh, maternal and child care. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um. In uh, in the chat in the chat there was um, there were a lot of questions about how we engage and whether we engage IFC in the study. I think Stella, you already alluded to that that um, we were reaching out, uh, but it was difficult to to get hold. Uh, but uh, maybe you can uh, share a few more details on that part of the process. You already, I think, mentioned while you were talking about the process, about uh, the efforts to engage uh, with IFC staff, but there were a lot of questions about that in the chat. So if you can tell us a bit more about engaging the IFC in, um, in, in this process. Um, I mean, we wrote to them. We wrote to them before we started the, we wrote to them before we started the process of, of, of data um, um, gathering around the qualitative uh, data gathering, um, we got we wrote to their head office as one response, but then the follow up from there became very difficult, and the response that we got it became a ping pong. You know, like I speak to, we are waiting for this person. There's a lot of bureaucracy and red tapes around um, how it who it is that we can speak to. So at the end of it all, we didn't have anybody 
who we could literally speak to in court. And even the people who we ended up speaking, the one person we ended up speaking to from Kenya is an advisor of, of IFC. And, 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 and of course, I mean, in terms of, um, she gave us a lot of information about the process, but she also really didn't also have some information. It's not very critical for the process. Um, when we went through the validation process, because we called, we still wrote back to them. We had two representatives from communication, a representative from communication and a representative from the civil society organizations just being there so it was it was it was important for us to actually um have them in the room and, and and having them in the room what it ended up doing is that they just ended up taking notes by the way and they also didn't respond to a lot of questions and until now i am sure marco and i and i and 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 and, and esther and Buki have never received any any i mean any follow-up through with the issues that we raised you know and so when we have a, a product like what we have, and particularly around RM and CAH, you know, reproductive maternal neonatal and adolescent health, including nutrition, that is supposed to improve um, the outcome of, um, of, 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 uh, of, uh, of women and, and, and children and young, and young people. And you ask very critical questions around equity, you're asking very critical questions around how does health system strengthening look like with such a product, you know, because you want to cut across, you know, um, and, and, and I mean, what is that I mean, in terms of affordability, availability, you know, and accessibility, and you don't get those answers, then, then it becomes very difficult to actually have an open conversation. So I think um, and this is a call to action, actually, to IFC, you know, and to the World Bank group that um, civil society is, is, is here to ask questions, is here to hold you accountable, is here to just get to deeply understand the work that you're doing how you're investing, you know, for instance, in healthcare and to understand how is it that you are addressing issues around people who come from low economic status, I mean, people with intersection of disability, sexual and gender minorities, young girls and women who live in poverty, you know, and how are you addressing, how you're in investing in them to be able to ensure that there's actually social protection and not what we, I mean, it ended up looking like an, exp I mean, a business, literally a business that um, it's actually for profit, you know, which was not, um, uh, prioritizing um, the health of our uh, people and who it should uh, prioritize. Thank you, Stella, for this. Um, I hope uh, I hope our process is uh, is is quite clear now to to all of our participants. Um, I saw a hand from Samuel Lobara uh, from VSO Kenya. Uh, Samuel, would you like to, to come in? You had a comment? Yes, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you well. Yeah, thank you to all the presenters and panelists. I think for me, it's an observation. Uh, now that we have eight years remaining, is there room to improve the redesigning of this uh, program? Because the, the intention looks good but we have teething issues. The study has brought out very key important issues. That is one. Then it two, is there room for a follow-up study, hopefully after four years to see whether the voice of civil society voice is a voice of, for inclusion. And these are very important issues that uh, an ordinary person in uh, Kenya would be raising. And hopefully, so, if we were to do a study, if the resources after two years, we expect a change and can there be that room for GFF to ensure that we actually, there's that kind of uh, better response to research because uh, if even a cooperative bank was unable to be available, just power and control comes in very strong. And therefore GFF can also support in terms of ensuring feedback mechanism to improve accountability, thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Um, I think uh, it was also clear in the limitations of, uh, of our study that AMF was just at the beginning of its rollout. And we heard today that there are like eight years in front of us for a full rollout of this program. Um, so indeed, uh, that's that's a great call to action actually to do a follow-up study probably you know in the in the middle of uh, of, of the rollout of the program to to reassess it and see how it lives up to to its goals and it would be very interesting also for the global financing facility to do such an assessment since as also Sneha said this is the first 
a blended finance uh, project that the GFF takes up. So I would say that's also a call for them. And uh, we also put it in the recommendation to do an assessment of this in, in the middle of, uh, of its way, but also for civil society you know, to continue the, the watchdog role. Um, that we maintain in in facilities like that that influence the access to healthcare uh, of the population. So thank you for uh, for this comment, uh, Samuel. Um, is there any other from our attendees that would like to to unmute and share some thoughts? Raise your hands, and then we we will unmute you from our side. I don't see any hands, so I will start wrapping up. And I would like to ask um, maybe Esther and Stella just to say a few final uh, final words um, in 30 seconds about this project and what comes up. So Esther, your 30 seconds come in. Okay, thank you very much. I think for me, what I can say is that, you know, we, you know, we really understand where AMEF is coming from, but in terms of, you know, the consumers, the beneficiaries that it was supposed to reach is really not the initial, you know, in it does not reflect the Kenyan standards. So in moving forward, it's yes, eight years of implementation, but we really need to reach to the real small, medium healthcare providers, because it is enriching that, then we are able to really ensure the services that, you know, women, girls, adolescents are able to really access affordable, acceptable, and quality healthcare from private facilities. Because the truth of the matter is that, you know, as much as we do have public facilities, we know there are gaps when it comes to health system strengthening. And, you know, in terms of even access to healthcare, in Kenya, there are gaps. And how, you know, Kenya has been filling the gaps is through, you know, private sector. So how can we ensure that the facility actually is there to ensure that it addresses the needs of those real small and medium uh, enterprises? And of course, the role of global financing facility as, as much as, you know, at least thank you Sneha to, to mention that, but also to really think through critically that if then the equipment and the loan will be to larger equipment, what does that mean when it comes to really reproductive maternal uh, adolescence um, health services? For, you know, those specifically vulnerable groups, are we really going to realize universal health coverage? Are we really to, going to ensure that there is uh, maternal health care that is affordable, acceptable, and quality from those small and medium enterprises that are within the communities that we are at? Thank you. Thank you, Esther. A few seconds for you, Stella, as well, before we close. I'm really grateful for this process because it's actually an eye opener. I know as a follow up, I've seen, held a meeting with lots of stakeholders post our analysis. And I am hoping that it's going to be a more transparent, a more collaborative, a more participatory process that is going to include civil society organization. It's also going to include um, citizens from Kenya and the, and the leadership. That um, the other thing that I'm hoping that this, um, the, the AMF product is going to is to relook re at its model and actually really honestly ask themselves the question is, who is the target audience? And to be honest around answering that question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stella. For us at Makeway, that was a very clear uh, case to investigate because it's real on the intersection between health systems and SRHR, and it really involves global actors that we are focusing on with our lobby and advocacy, and we will continue to work on these matters. Um, regarding our advocacy and work on the IFC, uh, we have... Uh, a new web page besides the one that you see on your screen you see one on the chat now by my colleague Marco where you will see together collected um, healthcare, private healthcare investments and final institutions uh, information all together in one page so I think it can be quite informative for folks that uh, want to work on these topics 
our uh, study is available. We're going to make this webinar recording and uh, presentation available as well. And uh, we are open for, uh, for feedback and further discussion if there is interest. And uh, we will continue our advocacy for the right to health for all and embracing intersectionality for health equity and justice. So thank you all for being with us today and thank you to the panelists and see you at the next occasion.